Hello again. Before I, I get into the reading from Augustine, uh, I want to talk a little bit about monasticism in the West. Um, monasticism is the monk movement of monks and nuns. Um, and the founder of Western monasticism is Benedict of Nursia, 480 to 543 A.D., um, in a way, Constantine making Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire created a problem for the church. And that problem is this. Uh, if you see yourself as the chosen few, what sociologists of religion call the sect type, okay, um, you can set your membership expectations very, very high. It doesn't bother you that um, many people, maybe most people, won't be able to live up to them. Because you don't, you see yourself as um, the God Squad, the elite. It's kind of like if you are Harvard or Yale what are your admission standards like? They're way up there. Because you don't want just anybody. You only want the very best. Okay, now if you are what sociologists of religion call the church type, and the model here is Europe where they have state churches. Um, in Germany, if you're born in Germany, you're a Lutheran unless you say you're not. Okay? Um, in in uh, England, you're, uh, you're Anglican unless you say you're not. Okay? Where everybody in the society is, is a member of the church. You can't set your standards way up yonder. You have to set them at a level that anybody has a decent chance of meeting them. Um, if you are uh, Grambling State or Louisiana Tech, okay, you can't have Harvard admission standards because we get some of our funding from the state and they're not going to give money to schools that their kids can't get into. Okay. Your admission standards have to be set at a place where most people can meet them. You know, essentially, our admission standards at Grambling are the same as the standards to graduate from high school in Louisiana. Okay. It's accessible to anybody. Well, the problem for the church is what happens to those very high standards of the Sermon on the Mount where uh, if all of a sudden now we've everybody is theoretically Christian. Uh, and so we have to have standards, uh, expectations that are at a level where, where most people have a chance. Well, monasticism is an answer to that. Because what monasticism basically does, it's, it sets up two levels of expectation. A basic level that anybody has a reasonable chance of meeting and that higher level that is only for a few and I can illustrate that by looking at the vows that Benedict set up the Benedictine order of monks and nuns still exists within the Catholic Church okay and Benedict outlined three vows poverty chastity and obedience okay take them one at a time the vow of poverty doesn't mean 
that the monk or nun pledges to always be poor. Rather, every Christian is expected to give God a part of, uh, of their wealth, the tithes and offerings. Monks and nuns go further and give up all individual ownership of property. Okay? The uh, Bible they read, the clothes they wear, the bed they sleep in belongs not to themselves as an individual, but to the order. Okay? No private property. That's what the vow of poverty means. Likewise, the vow of chastity. All Christians expected in um, all Christian denominations to refrain from sex with anyone other than their own husband or wife. Monks and nuns go further and vow chastity, a life of celibacy, no marriage, no sex. Now please note, this is not the governor's program on abstinence. That's the basic level. This means you do not marry. In the Catholic Church, priests, monks, nuns give up the idea of marriage. Okay? In order to devote themselves fully to the service of God. One order of, of nuns symbolizes this by wearing a wedding ring. Um, the idea being that they're not married to an earthly husband, but to Christ. Likewise, the vow of obedience. All Christians expected to obey the, the basic teachings of the church, the Ten Commandments and such. Monks and nuns go further and renounce all self-will, vowing to obey any instruction of the abbot or abbess who heads their monastery or convent. See how that sets up two levels, a basic level that's expected of all the lay people, the ordinary people, and a higher level of commitment that's not intended for everybody. It's never expected that, um, that most Catholics are going to be monks or nuns, but they are the ideal of devotion. And so they keep alive for the rest of us the idea that there is more to life than making a living and raising a family and trying to get your own way in the world. They are those who hear the call to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Okay. Now to Augustine, who, um, like Tertullian in origin, was from North Africa, born in Carthage in what is now Tunisia. Um, and I gave you excerpts from two of his books, Confessions, which is um, sometimes considered the first genuine autobiography in the West. An autobiography is a story of a person's life by that person. And, and he starts off reflecting uh, on his childhood, which, of course, he doesn't actually remember being a baby, None of us do by the time we grow up. But he knows what babies are like because he has seen babies and uh, he has been told what he was like as, as an infant. Uh, and he, he talks about how, uh, you know, babies want what they want when they want it. And when they don't get it, they cry. Either because they, you know, they're not able to articulate what's wrong. Uh, if any of you've ever taken care of a baby, you know that when they, they have only one way of letting you know there's a problem, and that is to cry, and it's up to you to figure out what's making them cry. And most of us have probably run through the checklist: check the diaper, no. Well, see if they need burping, no. Well, see if they're hungry, no. That doesn't seem to be it. Well, maybe they're sleepy, you know. Um, Now, what this leads him to is a, 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 a concept of the nature of human sinfulness. Line about um, 12, 13. 
It's in the weakness of the infant's limbs and not in its will where its innocence lies. I myself have seen and known an infant to be jealous, though it could not speak. It became pale and cast bitter looks on its foster brother. Okay, That attitude, I want what I want when I want it, for Augustine, that is the essence of human sinfulness. And it's not that babies are pure. They're as self-centered as anybody, maybe more so. Um, it's just that they can't put their desires into effect. Now, now he reflects on uh, growing up. And about line 45, he thinks about how uh, when, uh, when he was um, young, uh, uh, about 16, he and some friends uh, stole some pears um, from a neighbor. And he reflects on why he did that. You know, it wasn't because they were hungry. If, if that had been the case, you know, we might cut them some slack. Um, in fact, they didn't eat uh, most of what they stole. They gave it to the pigs. Uh, they, they did it just because they knew they weren't supposed to. And, and this leads him to reflect on why is it that uh, we um, that we sin. Um, lines about 58 to 68. You know, it, it's because there's something desirable there. And, um, you know, when we sin because we want something uh, too much or in the wrong way, an inordinate preference for these goods of a lower kind, <coughs> neglecting higher and better good things. You know, in order for us to be tempted, there has to be something good in there somewhere. Okay. Nobody would do something um, that didn't have some attractiveness to it. The problem, though, is that we want something too much, or we, we go about getting it in the wrong way, or... We settle for a cheap substitute, line about 86. Pride imitates high estate, uh, but only God is high above all. Um, you know, we want to be like God, but, but we don't want to be like God in the right way. We go, you know, we want to be like God in, 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 in terms of, uh, of a position, not in terms of, of, of uh, of God's character. Um, line 90, the enticements of the wanton would fain be deemed love. You know, we all want to be loved and we want to love, but we settle for cheap substitutes. We want to be loved, but we'll settle for getting laid. Curiosity affects, pretends, a desire for knowledge. But it's not really knowledge we want. It's only the appearance of knowledge. Uh, I encounter a lot of students in my, my time who don't really want an education. They just want a college degree. And they don't want to bother getting the education that that degree is supposed to symbolize. You see what I mean about settling for a cheap substitute? We want too much. We want it the wrong way. And so we go after things that are that are desirable but yet 
not the very best. Um, every evil for Augustine is simply a corrupted good. Evil is not a thing in itself. It's a good thing, but it's out of place or it's not controlled. Uh, I would use the analogy of fire. Um, you know, when the weather turns cold, you know, I, I want to have a fire in my furnace to heat the house, but I want it kept in the furnace. I don't want it running loose through the house. Okay, then it becomes destructive. Every good is a, every evil is a corruption of something that's good in itself, but it's not in the right context. It's not, it, it's too much. Um, it's not in the right way. Uh, it's, it's out of place. Uh, and that's the nature of evil for Augustine. Um, he talks about going to Carthage for what was the equivalent of college uh, and how he, um, he, he was kind of in love with the idea of being in love. And so he begins a relationship with a mistress that he um, that he continued for a long time and that always bothered him because he was um, during this period of his life uh, he was involved with uh, the Neoplatonists and a related group called the Manichaeans who taught that anything to do with the body uh, is evil. And he always wanted, he always thought he should be able to live without this relationship, but he can never bring himself to break it off. In fact, he says that his prayer at this time was, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. Meaning he wanted to give it up, but he wasn't ready to do so just yet. He trains as a teacher of rhetoric, public speaking, and he winds up going to uh, Milan in Italy. Um, and how in his personal life and in his uh, professional career, uh, he was always unhappy. And about line 130, 135, he talks about an experience where he's going to give a uh, speech in praise of the emperor, and he knew he was going to tell a bunch of lies, and he was going to be applauded by people who knew that what he was saying was a lie, and yet he wants those applause. And he comes across this poor mendicant, a beggar, uh, who's drunk, but he's a happy drunk. You know, some people, when they're drunk, are mad and want to fight. Some are sad and depressed and are crying. Uh, some are like him who are happy and laughing and jovial. If you've got to be around a drunk, be around a happy drunk. Um, this guy's a happy drunk. Now, Augustine looks at him and he knows that this isn't real happiness. You know, that all that happiness is going to be gone when the liquor wears off. But it drove home to him how empty his life was. <laughs> it wasn't real happiness, but what he was pursuing wasn't really happiness either. He talks uh, about um, his mother working to get him um, engaged. Uh, and the reason was that uh, while he, as long as he's living with a mistress, he couldn't be baptized. His mother was a Christian, his father a pagan. And, and by this time, I think his father is dead anyway. Um, and the, the marriage is arranged. Line 160, she, uh, she was two years shy 
of being marriageable age. Uh, so she would have been 10. Uh, girls could get married at that time at the age of 12. Um, Augustine was in his 30s at this point. Um, and uh, because her family would not allow um, her to marry Augustine as long as he had this mistress, um, he was forced to give her up. Uh, she goes back to North Africa, um, uh, leaving uh, their son with Augustine, his father. Interestingly, Augustine in his writings tells us the son's name, Adeodatus. He never tells us the mistress's name. But he couldn't wait, and so he um, takes another side chick. And he's really tormented by this in the excerpt from Book 8. Um, he is unable to control his uh, desires. And what I gave you in here is really the description of his experiences leading up uh, to his conversion to Christianity, where he finally finds the strength um, to think with the right head. And he winds up actually not, a, um, not only giving up the mistress, but he doesn't marry. Instead, he winds up being ordained a priest. Remember, in the Catholic Church, priests do not marry. Uh, they live celibate. And he, he goes back to North Africa, uh, ultimately as bishop there. Um, in line... Uh, book 10, line about 220, uh, he talks about uh, some of his views on sex um, in an abbreviated form that I'm going to amplify. Uh, Verily thou, he, the Confessions is written as a series of prayers confessing to God. Verily thou commandest me continence from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the ambition of the world. Some translations say the pride of life. And he, when it comes to sex, he considers three lifestyles. Thou commandest continency from fornication. And as for wedlock itself, thou hast counseled something better than what thou hast permitted. So he considers three possible lifestyles. Fornication, which is an old-fashioned word for sex outside of marriage. Marriage and celibacy. And he creates a hierarchy. The best, highest lifestyle is the life of celibacy. Second best is marriage. Worst is fornication. And here's where I'm going to amplify based on something else he wrote that I didn't give you. And that is called On the Good of Marriage. Uh, essentially, Augustine... Um, is responding to the Neoplatonists who said the only good lifestyle is celibacy. Uh, marriage is bad, but it's less bad than fornication. And the reason they thought it was bad was because, you know, very few people come back from their honeymoons still virgins, right? So, you're making you're giving in to the desires of the flesh. And remember for the Neoplatonists, like Plotinus, anything to do with the body and its desires is evil. And Augustine writes and says, no, that's not true. Um, they said marriage was the lesser of two evils. Augustine says, no, marriage is good. It's the lesser of two goods. Marriage is good, he says, because first of all, it's the way uh, through which God has ordained that the human race should continue, be fruitful, and multiply. Okay, when our oldest child was born, one of the little old ladies in the church where I was associate pastor gave us a little needlepoint pillow that said, a baby 
is God's opinion that the world should go on. Okay. Second, he says, marriage is good because it's within the family that's created by marriage that we learn to live together in an orderly society. I mean, think about it. Where do you learn to get along with other people? Where do you learn to share? Where do you learn that you have to obey the rules or face punishment? Uh, if you don't learn that at home, you probably don't learn it at all. Okay. And thirdly, Augustine says that marriage is good because it's a sacrament. It is a means through which um, the Christian can participate in the love of Christ for the church. So marriage, Augustine says, is good. The Neoplatonists are wrong. But he says, marriage is good, but celibacy is even better. Why is celibacy better? Well, first of all, Augustine thought the world was full and could afford to have some people who did not reproduce. Now, one wonders what he would say today when there are um, tens, maybe hundreds of times as many people in the world as uh, what there were in his. Um, the world's population has basically doubled in my lifetime. You know, I remember learning that there were 4 billion people in the world. Today, there's close to 8. Okay? Uh, and that, that trend has been going on for about 100 years or so. Um, but more importantly... Celibacy is better because within marriage you are giving some allowance to the desires of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. And there's always the danger if you give an inch, you'll take a mile. So he thinks it's better if you can live celibate, but nonetheless marriage is good, not a bad thing. Now, as he continues in this passage in the Confessions, uh, he reflects about um, his years of living with the mistress and the uh, images of female anatomy that that implanted in him. Um, and uh, he talks about having um, dreams of a sexual nature. And this really bothers him. You know, why is it that these illusions of the image in my soul and in my flesh, uh, when asleep, uh, false visions persuade uh, to that which, when waking, the true cannot? You know, he can control his sexual desires when he's awake, not so much when he's asleep. Uh, and and this, this, this bothers him. You know, does, does reason go to sleep with the senses of the body? What's up with this? It really troubles him that these um, these sexual fantasies and sexual desires are still there and emerge when he's asleep in a way that they don't when he is awake. Um, he's really tormented by that. In book 11... He uh, reflects on the nature of God's creation and how God creates. And that's a problem because how does an eternal God interact with the world of space and time? Um, you know, it's God doesn't create like uh, a, a sculptor who makes a statue out of clay or stone or wood or gold or something like that that's already there. You know, he he's not fashioning the world out of something that's already there. Um, and, of course, in the Genesis creation story, uh, the first one that we read earlier, God speaks things into existence. But that raises 
another set of problems for Augustine, line about 261. But how didst thou speak? Was it like the voice that came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, or the voice with which I'm speaking to you now, in which there I produce a sequence of sounds, one after another, and these sounds strike your ear um, and uh, create words in your mind? He says, no, it can't be that way. Uh, think about what's happening as I'm speaking. Uh, I, my diaphragm is pushing air out of my lungs through my vocal cords, which produce sound. And then my, my, um, my lips, my tongue, my teeth, my palate all shape those sounds into words one after another in sequence. And so you have to have a period of time uh, over which I am talking to you. And then that that produces sound waves that move through the air. And we're not even going to get into the process of what goes on through the computer because I'll be damned if I know. But uh, on the other end, um, the sound waves ultimately produced by me speaking uh, then strike your eardrums and produce vibrations and somehow the little bones and nerves in your ear uh, turn those sound waves into electrical impulses that go all up the auditory nerve into your brain and stimulate your brain in some pattern or another that um, produces meaningful sounds, words, in your mind. Well, God is a spirit. He doesn't have lungs and a diaphragm and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, um, and there's no passage of time. So what is meant in the Bible by God speaking to create the world, Augustine thinks is very different. And he picks up on the idea lines about 275 to 280, that in the New Testament, the word refers not just to God's spoken word, but to Christ. And so he says what this means is that God created the world through Christ. But he still hasn't gotten to the root of his problem which is how can the eternal interact with the world of space and time. And that leads him to what this section is really about. Line 295 to 300. God is not an object in the world. Space and time are themselves part of the world that God created. God is beyond them, above them. God is eternal. And in the eternal, nothing passes but the whole is present. Whereas within this world, no time is all at once present. Now, my way of getting at this is to use an analogy. Our perspective on the passage of time is like standing on the street corner watching a parade. You know, I can see clearly the unit in the parade that's right in front of me. And I can turn and look at the last couple of things that came by as they're moving away from me. And I can turn and look towards the next few uh, units as they're approaching. That's kind of like our perception of time. You know, the present moment is in front of us right now. I can reflect back on the past and remember it somewhat, but never with the sharpness of the, of the experience of the present. And I can look forward and anticipate 
uh, the future that I expect to be coming towards me. But again, not with the intensity of the present moment. Okay, we experience time as a sequence of events one after another. God's perspective is completely different. God's perspective is like flying in a helicopter above the parade. If you were doing that, you would see the whole parade stretched out in front of you all at the same time. Okay? That's what he means when he says, to God, every moment is always present. To God, there is no past, no present, no future. Every moment is always present. And that, Augustine says, is how God can know the future, because to him it's not future. It's how there can be prophecy where God reveals the future, because God knows it, because it's not future to him. For God, every day is today. There is no yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Line's about 320. <laughs> okay. There is for us within the world, but not for God. God is outside of space and time. Now, what's important about this is what, what Augustine is doing is God becomes like a platonic form, an idea. Um, there is not occupying space, no physical component. You know, God doesn't have a body, pure spirit, um, and not an object in this world that you can see. You know, in the 1960s, the Soviet Union, uh, an atheistic state, uh, sent an, a cosmonaut up into space, and when he orbited the Earth, he came back and he said, I can prove God doesn't exist because I was up in space and I didn't see God anywhere. And I guess he thought, that uh, religion in the West would simply shrivel up and die. The reaction was very different. People laughed at him. Why? Because nobody thought that if you went up into space in a rocket, you would see God the same way that you can see um, the um, Long Jones Hall if you're standing in the right place on Grambling's campus. Because God is not an object like Long Jones Hall is. That if you're in the right space, you can see it. God is out, completely outside this world. However big <coughs> this world may turn out to be, however vast space might be, God is beyond it. <coughs> God is not a physical object in this, in this world, but on a completely different level of existence. Not an object that you can study the way that, that you can study molecules. It's Augustine who taught the West to think this way. Okay. Now, a couple other things I want to give you briefly about Augustine's other book called City of God. The first, in uh, book 15, uh, his discussion of Noah and the Ark. Um, and this is an example of the reading the Bible allegorically that Origen talked about in the last lesson. Augustine is not interested in the literal meaning of the story of Noah's Ark about a man and a boat and a flood a long time ago. For him, everything in the story has a symbolic meaning. Uh, the Ark is a symbol of the city of God, the, the church, sojourning in the world, that is to say, of the church which is rescued by the wood, so the wood that the ark is made of becomes a symbol of the cross. And the dimensions of the ark, he said, represent the human body in which Christ came, based on the ratios of its dimensions. The door in the side of the ark symbolizes the wound made in Christ's side by the spear. Um... The square timbers uh, symbolize the immovable steadiness of the life of the saints. Okay. You see what he's doing? Everything in the story is a symbol that stands 
for something else. That's what an allegory is. And so that's an I want I gave you that because I wanted you to see an example of the kind of allegorical interpretation of the Bible that Origen was talking about. Now, the rest of the selection from City of God, and I'm not going to walk you through every passage, uh, is about two cities. <coughs> The earthly city and the heavenly city. The earthly city, of course, represents um, human society in the world. He really has in mind the Roman Empire. But it would apply equally to any government, any state. Um, the heavenly city, of course, symbolizes, represents the church. And he talks about how the earthly city is based on love of self the uh, heavenly city based on love of God. Um, now you might think from the way he describes it in, in, in this chapter 28, uh, the line numbering starts over when you get to city of God, um, lines 35 to 50. You would think he's going to say that the earthly city is bad, the heavenly city is good, but it is not so. They are both good, they are both necessary. Um, And I'm going to condense this for sake of time. The earthly city is necessary in order to create a relative peace, a relative justice, um, to restrain the worst evils that people might otherwise do. But the earthly city cannot, by its nature, compel people to genuinely be good. Um, because it operates mainly by coercion force. You know, we have a criminal justice system. Every government does. Um, you know, if you step out of line, if you commit crimes, you face punishment, right? Um that's necessary and it's good and Augustine thinks that um, it's important to Christians to participate even though he recognizes full well that it's only relative peace and relative justice that any government can ever provide because no government operated by human beings could ever be perfect. <laughs> okay, Only God is perfect. Still, we need to have government. Otherwise, living in society is not possible at all. And so love of neighbor compels that Christians do hold government office and even serve in the military. And the, the legitimation for this goes something like this. Well, you know, what are Christians called to do? To pietas, to piety, to serve God. Well, what does God command that we do? God commands that we love our neighbor. What does it mean to love your neighbor? Does it mean to feel all warm and fuzzy about them? No, it means to protect your neighbor from harm. And to protect your neighbor from harm, uh, you must restrain the evil impulses that would cause uh, someone to harm your neighbor. Um, take, for example, the New Testament parable of the Good Samaritan, where this guy is traveling and he's attacked by robbers and beaten up. Uh, and the religious officials come by and they pass him by because they think he's dead. And if they, uh, if they touch a dead body, they will not be able to do what they're supposed to do in the temple, uh, ritual impurity. And, and so they pass by, but the Samaritan, everybody hates the Samaritans uh, in, in the Jewish world. The Samaritan comes along and he takes care of, of this traveler uh, and provides for him while he, while he heals. And the point of the story is that's what love of neighbor is about. Well, a modern ethicist raises the question, what would the love of neighbor 
demand that the Good Samaritan do if he'd come along while the robbers are still beating the guy up? <laughs> okay, well, you got to stop him. But Augustine is a realist. You know, it may not be enough to say, okay, guys, knock it off. You might have to use force. If they're really intent on, on robbing this guy, it might even be that the only way you can stop them is to use deadly force. You don't want to do that. But sometimes that's what you have to do. You wish they wouldn't make you do it. But if that's the only way you can get them to stop, that's what you, you have to do. That's the way that Augustine legitimizes the killing of enemy soldiers in war or in this reading. The, the judge who, um, who uses torture, they didn't have you know all our CSI stuff. Um, all they had was witnesses. And it was routine to torture witnesses to see if their story would change under torture. And they also assumed that a person accused of a crime would not confess if, um, unless you torture him. Now, Augustine recognizes, uh, lines 30, 25 to 30, that sometimes, you know, an innocent person will confess under torture. But his world didn't have any alternative you know, they didn't have forensic evidence and all that. And so he knows the system's not perfect. That sometimes you're going to torture innocent people. And even though you don't intend it, maybe sometimes an innocent person will die under torture. But still, it's the best they had. Line 40, if such darkness shrouds social life, will a wise judge take his seat on the bench or no? Beyond question he will. For human society, which he thinks it a wickedness to abandon, constrains him and compels him to this duty. Love of neighbor demands that you protect your neighbor, even if that means getting your own hands dirty in the process. In this line of reasoning, Augustine has defined the dominant way that Western people have reasoned about the morality of going to war ever since his time. We call it the just war tradition. That doesn't mean, oh, it's just a war. It means justified war. That there are times when the only way to protect innocent people from harm is to fight a war. You don't want to do it. But sometimes you have to. It's worse not to. And love of neighbor demands that you do it. Now, if you're really perceptive, you may have noticed that this resembles the Roman code that we talked about with Virgil's Aeneid. But there's one important difference. And that is the Roman code, what you're serving is destiny. Here what you're serving is love of neighbor. But that's an important difference. Because to go back to the story of the Good Samaritan, it's not just the Samaritan that's your neighbor. It's also the robbers who are your neighbor. And so basing it on love of neighbor only justifies the minimum level of force that is absolutely necessary to protect the innocent person. Okay? And so it puts limits in a way that the Roman Code does not to what it justifies. This is why We are upset when a cop uses unnecessary force 
okay? Because, you know, we're only willing to justify the least amount of force that will do the job. You know, you're not justified in using a taser if the guy surrenders. And you're not justified in using a gun if a taser would do. If any of you have ever been in the military, the United States, I forget the exact term, but the Code of Military Justice. There are some things that you can't do, even in wartime, that are considered crimes. Okay? Because it's not necessary. It's not legitimized under this just war theory. Augustine's a pretty interesting character and a, a pretty important one in the history of Western thought. In fact, when I was in grad school at Florida State, they offered an entire three-hour course for religion majors and graduate students studying nothing but Augustine. That's how important he is in the history of Western thought. I could have chosen other people besides Tertullian and Origen. I could not have avoided spending a day on Augustine. He's that important.